So today I would like to tell you a little bit about building a security appliance based on FreeBSD. If we um, look into the uh, appliances market, we will find out that there is no many appliances built on the FreeBSD. Uh, if we will look into the security appliances, the amount is even uh, uh, there, there is uh, really, really few of them. So my motivation for this presentation is to motivate vendors who build appliance or planning to build appliance to use FreeBSD. I want to show you a good um, methodology which we were, we are working on building our appliance. So my name is Mariusz Zaborski. I work in Google Systems Company where for the last four years I'm building one of the most advanced um, PSM solution in the world. We are providing it as appliance. Um, I'm also having a hobby in, where, in which I am a FreeBSD committer. Um, so today we will try to build appliance like that. We will not focus most of the uh, hardware part of it, but we will look into the software and what FreeBSD is providing us built on it. Which, uh, in my presentation, I will be discussing only the uh, components that are built in the FreeBSD. We will not discuss the database or so on, only the components that are built uh, into the FreeBSD. So, if we are talking about the security appliance, the first thing is the data encryption. We need to have some kind of encryption. If we are building a security appliance, one of our assumptions is that we don't want to have any customer data that are uh, unencrypted. All the customer data should be encrypted. So this is the first topic we will be talking about. Another one is the storage. So which file system we are using, how we configure it, how we are upgrading it, uh, all the stuff we will be talking about. Mm. It's no matter how many um, disks you put into your appliance. It can be 12 terabytes, 20 terabytes, 30 terabytes. There always will be customer that's just not enough for him. So another component which we will talk about is external storage and how we are building it in, uh, in our appliance. And the last part which we will discuss today is our process security. So we will be discussing how build our whole infrastructure which does complicated things to be uh, a secure one. So first data encryption. Like I said, one of the assumptions which we have is that none of the customer data should be unencrypted. All of this kind of uh, things that is very important for, for us, for, uh, his, uh, for the customer. So we shouldn't have any unencrypted data in the client. So in, uh, in FreeBSD, we have three different uh, encryption methods. One is GD, uh, GDD, one is Jelly, and last one is native ZFS encryption. Unfortunately, when I am presenting this, we still don't have native ZFS encryption in the FreeBSD. And for the future development, if we will be building new appliances. This is also the encryption which we can take uh, and um, think about if we want to use it. It's, it's, uh, it's not that we can do everything with it, but it's, sometimes it can be very useful to do it. So for today, we will be looking into two uh, encryption methods, GBD and Java. So GBD is kind of old one. We have it from FreeBSD 5.0. It supports only one encryption method, ESS with CBC and only one uh, uh, key type. And it also provides uh, two overheads because for every write, we are using different key uh, for the disk. We also need to save this key for uh, on the disk. So every block saved also needs to save a, a key for this block. And there is also a CPU is the overhead because we need to generate all those keys. Um, so anybody of you still use GPT on their computers? Yeah, and there is not a lot of, uh, maybe for the stream record there wasn't any hand rising. Um, so, uh, and in 
the BSD project, we also don't uh, don't develop uh, a lot of features for GBD, so it's a little bit uh, outdated for us for today. But there is a reason for that, uh, because we have Jelly. Jelly has uh, another encryption-based uh, encryption method in FreeBSD. It supports a lot of different uh, uh, algorithms. It supports a, a lot of different key types. Um, what is also interesting uh, is also have integration ver verification uh, using uh, HMAC, where uh, we can detect if the data was uh, modified uh, randomly. Uh, but uh, in our appliances, we will not use that. I will tell a little bit later why not. Uh, it also don't have any uh, overhead like uh, GB, G, GBD. And what is also interesting, it supports one-time key, which means that we can generate one-time key and encrypt, for example, the swap partition with it, and then if we reboot the uh, machine, we again generate one-time key and encrypt the, the swap. So we don't care so much about swap if we, uh, after the reboot, so it's also a very useful uh, feature. Uh, when we were building uh, our first model of appliance, it didn't support a full disk encryption. Uh, now it supports, so maybe it's also something that is, would be very interesting for you. Um, so, the uh, other question is how we encrypt our, uh, our storage. So, we, uh, how, where do we uh, keep our keys to, the, uh, to our storage? So, we are keeping it on the pen drive which is uh, not only during the boot time, so we have a uh, encryption key in the, on the pen drive. Uh, customers asked during the boot to insert the pen drive with the key. He inserting it, we decrypt the, uh, the jelly partitions. If uh, he can then remove the, the pen drive from the machine, uh, if he trusts his uh, physical security, and of course he doesn't trust physical security of their servers, he can leave the pen drive in the machine, but this is not recommended the way. Um, what is also interesting, the initialization of the pen drives is during the first boot. So customer gets the machine, and he gets just empty pen drives. When he put the pen drives into the machine, this is the time when the pen drives are initialized and when the encryption, data, uh, encryption key is generated. This is a very handy thing because we as a, a vendor uh, don't have any secrets of our customers. And this is also very important because a few years ago, one of the big vendors had a, a security breach and they stole all the secrets from, from this, this vendor and he was Forced to change all the secrets in his customers, so this was this is very hard to do. So we just uh, mitigate this technique, not having any customer uh, secrets on our side. In case of virtual machines, because sometimes your appliance, uh, you will be asked if there is a virtual machine for for your appliance. If you are thinking about building also the virtual machine. There is no sense of using Android because it's very hard to put it to the hypervisor or, to, or whatever. And having like file which is encrypted with key and have another file which is the encryption key on the same machine, it's <coughs> kind of weird. So we decided that you can use a passphrase for, for that purpose or you just decide that you don't want encryption and that hypervisor will provide you one for it. So another topic which we will be discussing is storage. In FreeBSD we have two main uh, file systems which we will be discussing today, the ZFS and UFS. Um, we decided to use both uh, and it's, uh, I will tell you in a moment why. So ZFS has few interesting uh, features. Um, those are interesting features from security perspective or from the uh, from the uh, appliance uh, perspective. I, of course, it has a lot of more like copy on write or any other fancy things. But those are the things that I want to focus on, and I don't even have time to uh, talk about all of them. So. Uh, if we are, I will skip the reservation on write Z. Uh, reservation is a very 
a very interesting feature that allows you to reserve some space for, for the uh, file system. Uh, it can be useful sometimes. Uh, and RAID Z is a method, uh, it's a write for, for ZFS. We are using RAID Z2, RAID Z2, and anything that you need to remember from that is that uh, there, in RAID Z2 you lose two disks for uh, for um, parity, so you can lose two disks and still your appliance will be working. Um, this is the assumption that you need to remember, but uh, we will not go into more details of those two features. So first of all is ZFS checksum. Um, ZFS by default, by default provides you a uh, checksum. It not only checks on the uh, logs that it's saved, but also all the metadata of the uh, of the uh, block. Which is always the question: Why do we care, right? It's, it doesn't matter if I will write correctly or not, or maybe there will be some uh, mis uh, uh, miswrite. So this is the uh, the example that I love to show when I'm talking about such things like checksum or why we do we need the reproducible builds or whatever. This is an um, error that was presented in uh, OpenSSH two years ago. And there was a one, uh, one bad comparison between ID and chain, uh, channels allocated right here. Um, if because of this bug, we could root, uh, run some things as a root. And of course, the, the patch is very simple. We just uh, change the, um, change the uh, comparison operator. But if we look closer, very close, uh, there, the patch was in only one assembly uh, code. Uh, line of code. But if you will look even closer, it's only one byte of the change. But if you will, will look even closer, it's only one bit, which is uh, separated between <coughs> a safe and unsafe binary of our SSH. So uh, if you bought the ZFS book from Alan, uh, I, I bought one, uh, and I asked him for sign it, he, he wrote that these are plotting against you. That's true, but not fully true. Everything is plotting against you. Your CPU is plotting against you. You can have a random history. <coughs> the cables are uh, plotting against you because you can have a bit flip while you are writing. The microcontroller is uh, can have a bit flip. Everything that, of course, it's very theoretical, but everything that is uh, is. Uh, can make a difference, can make your SSH uh, unsecure. So this is why we, in, especially in a security environment, why we are uh, so interested in checksum, in ZFS. So another interesting feature is ZFS compression. So right now we have three types of ZFS, GZ, LZ4, and Z standard. Um, when we are building our appliance, uh, the Z, Z standard wasn't uh, wasn't in ZFS. So if you build a new appliance, it's also very handy to think about it. We decided to use LZ4 because it's compressed uh, data well, but it's also very very fast. So here we have an uh, example from our machine where we see that our dumps, which contains a lot of data, like two, three, four terabytes of data, or even more. Um, it's it's uh, compressed 16 times. So it's allow us to save a lot of space. Uh, it's also uh, allow us to save some IOPS, because if we compress data, that means we also need to write less data to the disk. So we also save some, uh, some bandwidth between uh, the CPU and, and the disk. Of course, there is one uh, one problem with that, which we uh, had uh, uh, in the past. It's what if your customer wants to take data from your appliance? So you have those. You are saying that you are using only two terabytes. But when I'm trying to 
SCP or uh, data from your uh, appliances, I need like 16 terabytes or 32 terabytes of storage. It's, it's great, right? Unfortunately, we don't have solution for, uh, for this. Uh, you need to be aware of that, but some customers not maybe a little bit angrier uh, on that. We, we're just saying that, yeah, just use some kind of compression and, and, and we'll be fine. And what also is good about uh, ZFS compression, I didn't say that, that it's totally transparent for your programs. You don't need to modify anything. Everything is done by file system itself. Uh, so you just write data and it's compressed. Your, your, your program will run uh, as good as previously without any modification. So another um, interesting feature for ZFS is a snapshot which basically creates a copy uh, of your uh, data uh, in a time. Uh, so if we uh, modify some data or we delete some data, there are, uh, there are multiple snapshots, let's say. It's, I don't want to go into the details, so, uh, so let's say like that. Um, it's very handy for any um, engineering that we need to do on the machine. So if we have a support uh, engineer that needs to do some checkups or modify something, uh, we encourage them or force them to, to create a snapshot before doing anything on the machine. If you break something, then we just roll back and everything works fine. So this is a very handy uh, feature for that. But other use case of snapshot is to build a multi-cluster for our appliance. Uh, I don't. Sh I wasn't sure if uh, everybody will know what is uh, multi-cluster uh, appliance. So I draw a nice picture. So multi-cluster means that we have uh, two nodes, and both nodes can get some data from, let's say, network, and uh, they both store the data uh, on their. Uh, on their side, where there is also a continuous replication between one and another to make sure that both have this exactly the same copy of data. So if there will be any user that want to access the data, it can do it on both nodes. Uh, if one node will uh, be damaged or will be in service or whatever, uh, customers still can have uh, uh, can access data on the, uh, the node which is working, both data from both, uh, from, from both nodes. So uh, here is our, uh, our, uh, how our ZFS looking, uh, is looking. We have, uh, what, what I'm saying, uh, in our uh, appliance, uh, very important are the dumps uh, file system. Uh, because there is the most thing that we are storing from, from the customer data, uh, as a customer data. So we have a two dumps uh, file system. One is local, so it's the file system that the node is working on. And another one is just with the no serial number of, this cluster, uh, of the second node. So this, uh, this uh, file system, which came from the another node, is read-only. You can only read from, from this uh, file system. And from into the local, we also can write. So we are taking a snapshot of this uh, file system from local file system, and we are pushing it incrementally. We're sending incremental snapshots to another uh, uh, to another uh, node in our uh, class and multi-master uh, solution. Um, here uh, we are doing that uh, kind of um, often, like even a few minutes, a few seconds, it's, it doesn't matter really, uh, because those uh, incremental snapshots are kind of small, so uh, we can uh, get data uh, quickly and uh, receiving and sending snapshots is very fast, so, so uh, we don't care really about that. So uh, ZFS is also evolving and uh, FreeBSD uh, with it. So before one of the changes, we was doing like very nasty hack because ZFS, when it was sending the snapshot, was decompressing the data. So 
our data compressed very well, so we piped it to LZ4, then we piped it to SSH, then on the side of the uh, another node, we uh, decompress the data, and we store it to ZFS, which again compressed the data. This was, uh, the compression The compression was very quickly, so, so, so it was worth it, but right now, after the uh, change in the free BSD, uh, we just can send and receive ZFS because uh, we are able to um, we are able to send compressed uh, snapshots. Um, there are two downsides of uh, the things I already told you. Uh, one of them, if we if we ask our uh, support engineer to work on the machine and something is happening on the machine, like customer is creating some data or whatever, uh, and we will roll back to the previous version, we can lose some data. So this is something that you need to be aware of, that if you are rollbacking from, from snapshot, you can lose data. The same is we are also using snapshot during the upgrade process, which I will show you a little bit later. And uh, if we allow customer to upgrade the machine, check if everything is working, and if he decided that something is not working, he is allowed to roll back to the previous version. But we are saying to him also that be careful with that because you can lose data. So please check if everything is fine, but don't allow to use this uh, machine before doing so. Uh, another problem with the snapshot, and uh, for example, during the upgrade, is that if we will uh, create a new file system and we will roll back to the previous version of the uh, of our appliance, then uh, snapshot not work. Uh, they don't remove the file system that was created. So this is also a problem for us because if the Code sometimes need to be aware that they can be a uh, other version of the file system. And another thing with the uh, snapshot, which is a little bit downside when we are building a cluster multi-master, is that if one node will get broken or it's not uh, working for for some time, uh, another node is keeping a snapshot whole time of uh, for that. So, for example, if we send uh, appliance to service and it's came back in month, after month, and the node that was working is keeping the snapshot during that time. Which means, every time when we are removing something, there's a big chance that uh, the logs will not be free. They will be uh, assigned to the snapshot. And so, uh, this can, uh, this can um, the result of that can be that we can lose some space in the cluster multi. Uh, fortunately, there are solutions to uh, two of those problems. One of them is checkpoints, which we are, uh, we are waiting for. They are not yet in the previous I I don't think they are even in OpenZFS, right? Checkpoints. I think it was committed like two or three weeks ago. Okay. In, in ZF, OpenZFS, right? Okay. Uh, which allow us to make a snapshot of whole pool, which means that if uh, we add file system or uh, some, we will change some properties, then when we are rolled back into to checkpoints, we also will roll back with all those changes. Or even if we will upgrade the version of, free, uh, of ZFS, we also will roll back to the previous version of ZFS. So very handy uh, feature. And another uh, feature which is very interesting for us is bookmarks, which we can use instead of snapshots in case of cluster multi-master. Uh, bookmarks are more or less like snapshots, but don't allow you to uh, roll back to the, uh, to the state that you have, but allow you to, um, to replicate uh, the state of the machine. So it, uh, bookmarks don't keep the data, only keep the information that those data was removed, and we are free to, to free blocks them. So when we are sending the incremental snapshot, we only send it, yeah, those data need to be free. So uh, what about downside of the ZFS itself? Uh, we have some problems, uh, because we have at least like 
one terabyte or 30 terabyte, depends on the, of the size of the files. Uh, when we was removing bigger file systems uh, in, uh, in our appliance, we was, and something goes wrong, right? Machine was uh, shut down from, for some reason, and machine was booted, we was, there was a um, problem that we was unable to import uh, the, uh, the pool. Because ZFS did some weird stuff when he wanted to uh, create the space, so um, he needed to map all the mods or whatever to, to, to free it, and we didn't have enough RAM, so uh, that was also fixed. Right? There is now other method of, of uh, freeing the blocks, but uh, yeah. Uh, ZFS also didn't have a full disk encryption, and uh, if we would use only ZFS, then we would, wouldn't be able to use a full disk encryption. There, there wasn't a full disk encryption at the time we, will, we were developing our appliance. Uh, if something goes really, really wrong, we still want to get somehow to the machine, so we don't care about the customer data. We just care to SSH to the machine and see uh, seem what will happen uh, in the machine. And uh, also we want, want to be able to re reset machine to the uh, state that the uh, machine doesn't have any data in it. So because of that, we decided that we will use uh, Jelly, and on top of Jelly, we will use ZFS. And this will keep our uh, customer uh, data, which, like I said, they are JSON, they have a lot of uh, cool features, and so on, and so on, and they're unencrypted. But we decided that we will use UF, UFS as a file system for uh, our operating system. So we have a UF, uh, free partition of UFS, which contains only uh, operating system, which is mounted read only. We don't store any data there. There is no really access there. We just uh, we just have there all the binaries itself. Uh, the data are not encrypted on this file system. Uh, so if something goes wrong, we don't need to go with the pen drives and put the pen drives to the machine and say, hey, now you put it from FreeBSD and do whatever. No, we can just boot from the machine, something isn't working, we can configure SSH or whatever and, and walk into the machine. Uh, and like I said, uh, we try to uh, reflect promises that Z ZFS give us with the UFS. So for example, we want to be able to survive uh, when two disks will be damaged. So if two disks will be damaged, ZFS We'll handle it because we are using Red Z2, but what with UFS? How, how we are doing that? So this is how our uh, partition UFS, uh, uh, how our GPT partition uh, looks like. So we have a boot partition which needs to be uh, with the boot code to, to boot our machine. We have three different partition uh, with the system. Um, this is the system zero, system one, system two, and uh, after the uh, mi minus sign, we have a uh, number of the disk we are working on. So this is a dash zero, so we are uh, having system zero, zero. We have also a swap partition and the data, which is uh, partition with our uh, ZFS and JED. And also, like I said before, uh, Swap is also encrypted with the uh, Jolly one-time uh, password, using one-time password. So to reflect with Rails 2, we group all the UFS uh, file uh, systems into a, a mirror. It's a read-only file system, so we really don't care. It's like fixed size, we don't manipulate anything with that. So here is a real system zero, which contains all the disk, uh, all the system zero for all the disks. In case of this swap partition, it's a little bit more complicated because we're creating a multiple swap. Uh, because if we would put it in the one mirror, then we would lose a lot of space. We have what, like, let's say, twelve disks. So if we would put all the disks in uh, twelve disks, let's say one terabyte. 
if we will put all those disks in one, uh, sorry, one more time. If we have uh, a swap partition that has like four uh, gigabytes, and we put all those partitions into one mirror, we will get one swap partition which contains uh, four, uh, four gigabyte, uh, gigabytes. So it wasn't enough for us, it just uh, doesn't make any sense. So we group this into three, uh, group of three. So if any of two disks will uh, fail, we still can work. So how does Algorit uh, looks in, in our appliance? So first, uh, we have a special GPT flag called bootme, which means from which, which UFS we want to boot. It's built into the FreeBSD. We didn't need to do anything. This is uh, something that you can grab from, from, the, uh, from the FreeBSD. So uh, then we are overwriting one of the, uh, of the uh, system that is free. So if we are upgrading from uh, system zero, we are overwriting system one. We just put new operating system, new tools, everything are put there. And we, uh, use, to, uh, we use another flag, which is called boot once, uh, which means that we want to try only once to boot from this partition. When we are setting from GPART this, this partition, we also uh, automatic, uh, automatically get a boot me flag on this partition as well. So then we just reboot our operating system. And uh, the bootloader removes boot me from the uh, partition that had a boot once and boot me flag. That means that he already tried this partition. And now, even if kernel didn't load or whatever happens, he knows that he don't need to try again use uh, this uh, partition. So if something happens on the uh, in the moment of the uh, from from this moment, we just reboot and we will boot with, from the partition that has boot me. Uh, uh, so if something goes uh, wrong, let's let's go with the pes pessimistic way. So we creating ZFS snapshot. We run all our hardware script. I don't know. We modifying ZFS. We uh, trying to change something in database. Whatever, whatever. Hardware are cured. We just reboot the machine at this point. We uh, no, no no matter what uh, problem was was happening, we just reboot the machine. After that. Like I said, we have two uh, two partitions. One is uh, there is a flag boot me, and another is boot once. There is not a boot once boot me flag, so uh, loader will choose the boot me uh, partition to boot. And we just do uh, we just do ZFS uh, rollback to rollback all the changes that we made uh, on the uh, file system, and operating system will change the boot once flag to boot fail, but we also know that something's happened uh, wrong during uh, this boot. If something, uh, if the algorithm was successful, we just don't reboot machine, we find the partition where uh, boot once is set, and we change it to boot me, also removing the boot me from the uh, partition that uh, had um, an old version of operating. So, uh, because all of those uh, changes that I already mentioned, like uh, having Jali, <coughs> having uh, mirrored uh, system, uh, having mirrored swap, having uh, different, uh, 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 yeah, uh, we can't uh, do automatically um, hot plug the disk. There is like Z, uh, ZFS. Which do that for you in a normal uh, in a normal situation. Unfortunately, that we have all those uh, different scripts, we need to implement a new script. Uh, let's say I call it here a uh, new disk and use uh, dev D to uh, uh, to see when the new disk occurred and then call this uh, uh, call this uh, uh, function to uh, Partitionate and uh, adds uh, mirroring and so on to, to our uh, to our system. 
So, uh, like I mentioned before, there will be always customer that the storage you will provide to him is not enough for him. There, uh, uh, so, let's see what option do we have in that area. So, in, ZF, uh, in the FreeBSD, we have the three methods that we was considering using. One is NFS, which is the oldest one, and uh, and iSCSI, which is kind of, uh, it's, I think it's kind of new. I think it's three years with us or two years with us, something like that. And also we uh, was considering using uh, SAL over FC. So the problem with NFS is that we don't have any encryption in NFS. Uh, every package is just sending some message. We, we, uh, if we uh, working in some uh, more hustle environment, then somebody can look what, what we are writing to encrypted uh, to our uh, storage, and we want to provide a security uh, appliance. So that was a big problem for us. Uh, there is no really authorization. Uh, I don't think that uh, NFS is longer the uh, corporate solution. Uh, most of uh, corporations are mm, removing NFS from, from their uh, infrastructure. Uh, the only advantage of this solution was that we was able to, to mount NFS on multiple uh, machine uh, cement, cement in the same time. Uh, and uh, if we are considering building the uh, multi-master uh, solution, that was something that we was interested in. But because of the uh, other uh, problems with NFS, we decided to, to resign from this approach. Um, but uh, the, the possibility to mount the uh, NFS on multi-machine isn't really such a great feature either, because if we would use iSCSI or Sunover FC, then we just can say, OK, now you, now this node should also use this uh, external storage and uh, everything. So, so um, iSCSI is a good choice to, to go with. It has encryption, it has authentication. Uh, we are unfortunately not able to mount it on multi machine, but I, like I said, it's not really a problem for us. But uh, is it a corporation solution already? Uh, probably, uh, but uh, most of our customers was uh, still uh, looking uh, for other, other solutions. So we end up with using Sun over FC. Uh, this is a separate network. We connecting to it, but uh, it, does it have uh, encryption and authorization? By default, no, but we can configure it with Jelly, and when we configure it with Jelly, we can configure with ZFS on top of the Jelly, and we get everything we want. So it's encryption, it's authorization, and we also have uh, a corporate solution. So we decided to use uh, Sun over FC with uh, our own encryption and our own uh, file system. Uh, so, uh, what in case of uh, any problems with the uh, with the FC cards? Um, we want some redundancy in uh, any of our in components. So, in that case, we also put in two FC uh, cards into the uh, the appliance. The problem with that is that uh, the resources which are provided by uh, by the storage are seen as two different loans in FreeBSD, so we need to um, somehow uh, compare them, the, the, uh, compare them, and then we can use GMultipub, a special GEOM uh, provider, which allows us to um, to aggregate the same disk, which came with a different name. So this is the trick we can use to, to uh, uh, handle multiple FC cards. So the last topic today is to have time. I think so. Um, so the last topic which I want to discuss is the process security. Uh, so what is the basic problem with the security of the single process? Is that uh, we can't build anything from the scratch. 
if we are a vendor and we have some deadlines and we want to build some fancy software, we will probably not build anything from scratch. We will take some third-party uh, program, open source or whatever, and we will try to uh, modify it and uh, integrate in our system. The problem is that if we take in this third-party uh, third party program, we are unable to audit it. It's very hard to audit programs. A big corporation even doesn't do that too often because it's just so much work. So the question is who we really trust. So somebody told me uh, at some point, I, I unfortunately don't remember who, but the, the sentence stay with me that security stops where the trust begins. So if we need to trust somebody, that means that all, all the security which we want to build, we're trying to, we, we are mm, giving him. Because he is now responsible for security of our appliance. If he will, in his code, provide some bug, then our appliance is exploitable. So how we can live with that? Who, who we can trust? So the question answer is that we don't need to trust anybody. It's, the question how we build our infrastructure to not do so. So uh, in our case, we are building our infrastructure to have one privileged process, which is built from us, by us. Uh, we control it. We know what it's doing. And then we get this big piece of software that we want to use in our appliance. And we built around it unprivileged process. This unprivileged process is somehow sandboxed. We don't have access to a lot of resources. We try to minimize uh, access as much as we can. And uh, they are uh, communicate between it using very simple IPC. Like we are trying to minimize the amount of the code that we need to trust. So uh, this simple IPC can be like, OK, uh, this is, let's say our, our appliance is, uh, is dumping SSH connection. So uh, the unprivileged process is allowed only to, uh, to talk to the client first. So client is sending us some credentials. So unprivileged uh, process is saying, okay, this are my credentials. Are they right? And then privileged process can decide what to do next. So, like I said, privileged process has access to everything. It has access to TV, uh, has access to storage, network, whatever he needs. He also out, uh, do, uh, is doing the authentication. So this is very important. We can authenticate in the unprivileged process because we don't trust it. So if you have any authentication, you need to, um, you need to do it in the privileged process. And uh, it's extent the, uh, the unprivileged process. So the best solution is when the unprivileged process is uh, starting, it has a limit on the RAM he can use. He has a limit on CPU. He has really, really small amount of things that he can really use. So if we're talking about the unprivileged process, he has only, like let's say, single file descriptor to talk with, uh, to dump some uh, data, it would be great if we, the single uh, descriptor would be uh, right only, that he cannot jump uh, over this descriptor and don't see what was in the past, uh, or overwrite some data. Uh, it depends what we are doing uh, in our one privilege process, but he can have like single, two, three file descriptor to uh, network access, but he cannot create a new network. Uh, uh, network uh, connections, but he knows the complicated stuff. So he knows how to do SSH. He knows how to do RDP or whatever. He do the complicated thing. Uh, the privileged process do only the simple thing. Um, so yeah, so like I said, they communicate only using very simple commands like, hey, here are my credentials and wait for answer. Uh, it's also, we are trying to limit the RAM, CPU time, and so on of this process. So, with FreeBSD, 
we can use few components that are built in the Capsicum framework and which close our process in very tight sandbox. And we can use libnv, which also is in uh, FreeBSD, uh, to, for implementing very simple uh, communication between privileged and unprivileged process. So Capsicum is kind of my favorite topic, so I will not try to tell you a lot of it. Uh, it's provided us very tight sandboxing. We, we can we don't have access to any global language systems. So, like I said, we cannot create. If we enter the capability mode, we cannot create new connections. We cannot open files. We cannot do anything suspicious. Uh, and like I said, it would be fine. It would be interesting if the uh, unprivileged process can only write data to file descriptor, but couldn't overwrite our uh, our file or jump over the file to see what was uh, in in the past. So this also implemented the capsicum called capability rights, when you can uh, limit the single descriptor even further, like I described. Uh, no, uh, like I described. Uh, LibNV is a very simple uh, IPC library. Uh, it uh, has uh, few types, very interesting types, uh, like very basic type, like string, number, bool. Uh, we can do nice to them list, but uh, what is very important, what not every library provides us, you can also send descriptors over the uh, end release. Uh, we have few functions like add and get. Take move. This is our simple operation on on the uh, on the element. Uh, every element is named, so we just say, uh, let's say, end list add string um, growth with a string something, right? Uh, so very simple IPC, very easy to use, uh, and code base is very very tiny of it. So is privilege separation hard? Uh, my team, which I work in, isn't very big, but we was able to sandbox in that way. Kind of a lot of uh, big projects like OpenSSH, FreeRTP, FreeRTDS, or even like programs for OCR with uh, Tessera. So, if we can do that, you also can do that with some effort. So. Uh, how, how step by step it would look like to, to do so. Uh, let's say we want to implement some uh, network demo. So we have our privilege process, which is listening for, for new connection. When new connection arrives, we, uh, when client is trying to uh, connect, we create an unprivileged process. Uh, let's say our client wants to authenticate. So, uh, Client is sending credential. The unprivileged process is doing all the encapsulation of this uh, of, of this credential. So it's understand how to get the credential from uh, SSH or SSL or whatever, and send those credential to the privileged process in using very simple IPC. When the process is uh, authenticated, when the user is authenticated, we write the uh, RAM and CPU of this process. Uh, we also can, for example, uh, connect to the external server that the client wants to talk with. We then pass this uh, descriptor uh, over to the unprivileged process. And let's say that our, um, our uh, unprivileged process also needs some descriptor for dumping some logs. So we also are creating dump file right now, and we also are sending this dump uh, descriptor over to uh, the unprivileged uh, process. So this was only one method of sandboxing that I implemented. Uh, in uh, FreeBSD we have also jails and Cloud API. Uh, jails are already known by you. There are like uh, process containers that uh, provides you uh, provides you like uh, yeah they provide you basically container. Cloud API are a little bit more, more tricky. But, for example, we are considering using Cloud ABI for user scripts. Cloud ABI has, for example, a support for Python. So we can put uh, in, uh, in the Cloud ABI Python script and uh, allow uh, customer to do some stuff like connect to the um, 
to the song machine and change the password. So, thank you very much. Here are some of my uh, contacts. If you're interested in reaching me somehow, I also will be here on the conference. And maybe there are some questions. Yeah. You're on the I don't think so. I don't know. Just to do the question. Okay. Um, so, you have the kernel unencrypted, I guess? The kernel you are putting from is from an unencrypted uh, partition, right? Uh, kernel is from an unencrypted. Yes. Okay, so have you looked at uh, EFI and TPM and such like that, stuff like that that can authenticate? Because right yes. now, right now, your kernel is unencrypted and not authenticated. Yes, uh, that's the problem we have. But uh, FreeBSD right now don't have support for TPM, so we are unfortunately not using it. Uh, we was thinking about uh, using full disk encryption for that purpose. It's not ideal uh, because you know customers still can uh, decrypt the data and modify the kernel or, or whatever. But uh, for now, no, it's, it's just uh, unencrypted. And uh, on NFS, you can do authentication with NFS four. Yeah, I'm not sure about encryption. I don't know if packets uh, when you are authenticated are encrypted or not, but you can do authentication. Yes. But don't use it. With new NFS, you can do that, but new NFS isn't kind of popular, so it's also not the case you want to support. And I don't think it's kind of a really good uh, support in, in FreeBSD. So we, it depends. <laughs> so, so, it's complicated. Yeah, exactly. So we decided uh, to go with the way that works and no, we have. Uh, we are sure that it's a secure way of doing that. Um, you talked about the lib NB. Yes. That is a new library that appeared in the FreeBSD Raven. So I don't know the use case of lib NB. If you have, please tell me the detail, the use case of lib NB. So yeah, lib NB, for example, is used in Casper and. Yes, and it's done uh, all the communication between uh, process and uh, Casper. Um, and uh, so this is interesting because uh, LibNB was kind of re implemented because there is a LibNB in uh, SAM, uh, sorry, in OpenZFS, but it's kind of too big and have too complicated some of the. Uh, this is kind of too complicated, so we decided to re-implement it and build it with a, a new approach, very simple. Um, and uh, but you will also find, for example, uh, LibNB in Hast, the the demon of the for the um, uh, high availability storage. So yeah, there are a few use cases in FreeBSD where we, we are using. We also have uh, a release in the in the kernel. The, the, the kernel version of FreeBSD, and one of the driver is using it, but I don't remember right now which one. Um, uh, Presumably, if you have an idea, uh, we can apply the libnb to other commands on a FreeBSD-based commands. For example, on SSH. Uh, separation yeah, but separation? the problem problem with SSH is that we don't want to introduce new code there because it's kind of contribution code, so we want to limit the way when we interact with uh, SSH. Uh, so, yeah, we, 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 we have some plans where we can, uh, in other places, use and release. Uh, Alan just had an idea to integrate with, with UCL to parse all the formats, uh, complicated formats like JSON and so on, and allow uh, and push the configuration using the zip and v tool to, to, to have one uh, simple uh, library that provides the configuration to all the demos or so. But this is like uh, something that we thinking about. Okay. Any other question? Okay, so thank you very much.